OK, here we go. Um, so picking up where we left off uh, in our discussion about wavelengths and frequencies, uh, we need to talk about this concept called resonance. What resonance means is essentially when you manage to take a given frequency and fit it inside of some object that is able to uh, essentially amplify it, okay, or <laughs> resonate it. Uh, an example here in the, on the slide is, is a string, okay. Uh, I have a little string right here. I can demonstrate, hopefully, this concept. Um, so I've just got the other end of the strings hooked up to a little speaker here. Uh, and, you know, as I wiggle the little speaker here, the string wiggles, right? And what I'm looking for is the frequency that makes it wiggle a lot. There it goes. So this is, at the moment, 4.4 .4 hertz. Okay, not a frequency we can hear, but that's a frequency that fits on this string very nicely. You know, if I take it down to 3.4, it stops wiggling quite so much, right? If I take it down to 2.4, it's barely moving at all now, okay? But 4.4 .4 hertz is what is called the fundamental resonant frequency of this particular string, which is a function of its length and elasticity and other things like that, okay? So I have found the fundamental resonant frequency of this string. Now, uh, the part that we're seeing is really, I mean, the length of that string, if we were to measure that, uh, the, the frequency that of 4.4 hertz is actually has a wavelength twice as long as that string, okay? Because the part that we're seeing right now is as it goes up and down, up and down, compression, refraction, compression, refraction, right? Up, down, up, down, up, down. So at any given point, we're only seeing half of the full wavelength, right? The whole wave continues on. So right now, we're seeing that part of it, right? It's either going up or down, okay? But the whole wave continues on, right? It's the whole wavelength is actually twice the length of that string. Okay, so uh, this is called the fundamental resonant frequency. Whoops, let's go back. What did I do? There we go. Uh, fundamental resonant frequency. In that case, for a string with you know the ends of the string are fixed on each end, uh, the wavelength of that fundamental resonant frequency is twice the length of the string. Okay, that's the important piece. Now, there are other frequencies that will resonate on this string. Okay, for example, if I take this up to, oops, no. Okay, there's, there's 8.4, okay? That's, that's an octave up. I've doubled the frequency now. There's another frequency that resonates on this string. This is called the first harmonic, okay? Yeah, so here we're at now seeing the full wavelength, right? So now uh, this is 8.4 hertz. So this is the first harmonic resonant frequency. Um, what would be 4.4 times 3? There's our third harmonic, or our oh. second harmonic, sorry. So, wait. Right. So these are just examples of resonant frequencies, OK? So the fundamental resonant frequency is this first one, top left. The, sometimes, that actually, in, in, technically, it's also called the first harmonic or the fundamental. Uh, but sometimes I say that the harmonic is actually, the set first harmonic is actually technically the second. So just catch me on that if I see that. But okay. uh, so that's the fundamental or the first harmonic. Second one is this one, right, where you're actually able to fit two full cycles 
on the on the string. The next one, you're getting three full cycles at a time, uh, and then you know you get four. You can keep going on the way on up. So what would be four point five times four? There's another one, right? So that's this one. Okay, and we can keep going forever, right? Yes, Kai. So when you're doing this, when it's uh, ah crap, I forgot the term for the different types of waves. When you're doing this with actual compression and refraction and with particles, how is this? How is the like this? Because this makes sense to me. Like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, if the length corresponds with the wavelength in yeah. a way that makes it resonate. I'm still not fully on with. Why that is like it makes sense that the link is doing something there, but when you put it into particles, that's when it starts. To so that's the next thing, okay. right? You're thinking two slides ahead of me at the moment, which is good because you know where I'm headed. Okay, so give me a minute and I'll get there. Uh, so uh, we this could go on forever, right? There are infinite harmonics that we could ultimately get to resonate on this string. Okay, we've found the first four. Okay, but they would, you know. Theoretically, they would go on forever. And we, eventually, we'd get to ones we could hear. At the moment, we're only at 18 hertz. Um, we, you know, even if we got, you know, well, let's see, we could, you know, there's, there's another one. That's 39. Still haven't gotten to ones we can really hear very well. And now we're getting to the limits of the amplitude of our little driver here. There's another one. Or it's close anyway. So I'm at, now we're at frequencies we can theoretically hear. We're at about 65 hertz now. You can, if you look carefully, you can see it, right? Yeah, yeah. Right? But you know, there's an excursion limit of my little driver here. So we, you, the higher we get, the lower the amplitude is going to be. Yeah, you can still see it. So there we go. There, oh, almost found it. So that's 81.4. So I'm off now. I'm, I'm at a frequency that doesn't resonate. You can hardly see anything, right? But there's almost one right there, right? So you go on forever, right? There's multiple frequencies that could resonate on this string. Uh, and uh, in reality, in a complex sound, you would have a lot of those harmonics all happening all at the same time, right? When you actually have a stringed instrument that you play, Yes, there is the fundamental frequency, which is the note that you would perceive that as. But that what makes you know, a guitar, for example, sound different from a violin, they're both a string that's vibrating. What, what makes them sound different is, the, is the, the amount of harmonics, harmonic frequencies that are happening at the same time. So they're both playing middle C, for example, but they sound different. They sound different because of the harmonic signature. Which of these extra frequencies are also happening at the same time. Because we've just shown that multiple frequencies can resonate on the same length of string. Okay? And so the geometry of the, you know, of the, ch the wooden chamber of that instrument and you know, the, t the, the tension of the string and you know, all of these sorts of things, that the way that it's vibrated, you know, the bowing versus plucking, these all affect which harmonics uh, will want to resonate at any given time. But that, the, the signature, it's called the harmonic signature, that decides what something sounds like. Okay? They're both doing the same fundamental frequency. They're both playing middle C. But what makes them sound different are the harmonics. Okay? So that's, that's on a string. And when you're doing a string, again, uh, the, we're not really going to deal with harmonics a whole lot. Um, I'm, we're primarily interested in fundamental resonance. Uh, just because it's, it's not entirely practical for us to spend a whole lot of time calculating harmonics. It's, it's not hard to do, but it's not particularly important to us. 
uh, for the kinds of things that we're interested in when we're talking about designing sound systems. But what we are very interested in fundamental resonances for reasons that I'll explain as we go along here. Yeah. And fundamental reson resonance is just the fact that something is resonating it's the, at a certain Whatever is, it's the lowest frequency that can resonate on that string or in that room or whatever. Okay. okay. So whatever the thing is that you're trying to resonate, whatever the lowest frequency is, that fits in there. That's the fundamental resonance. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about now another sort of change. So let's let's now actually try to do this with air. Okay, so this is uh, a pipe. Okay, maybe like an organ pipe, or you know, or like something you, a flute you would blow into, or something like this. Okay, this is now we're uh, we're actually doing it with air. Okay, uh, depends on the nature of the pipe. Okay, if the pipe is open at both ends. And you're able to somehow uh, oscillate some air inside of there, then you would find a you know a fundamental resonant frequency, a lowest the lowest frequency that would resonate in there, and that frequency would also be have a wavelength that's twice the length of that pipe, just like the string. Okay, so if it's if the pipe is open at both ends, then the fundamental resonant frequency has a wavelength. That is twice as long as the pipe. And therefore, you could calculate that, right? If you knew the length of the pipe, and you knew, uh, then you could double that, and you would have the wavelength of the fundamental resonant frequency. And from that wavelength, you could get a frequency, which is what we learned how to do last week. Okay? And you would know then at that point which frequency would resonate fundamentally in that pipe. Now, if you cap one end of the pipe, it gets a little bit different. Okay? If one end of the pipe is closed, then the fundamental resonant frequency actually has a wavelength that is four times as long as the pipe. Okay, uh, and I can demonstrate that here. That's what I, what this little gizmo is that I have. Um, so I have a pipe here, and I've just it's filled with water, and the water is just used to control the the acoustic depth of the pipe. You know, when when there's water there, there's enough of an impedance mismatch that the sound wave in the air will. You know, behave as though we've just capped the, the, the pipe at that, at that depth. Okay? So uh, let me show you what, what I mean now by resonance. So this is, this is just a tuning fork. Okay? And if I hit this tuning fork, can you, can you hear it? It's very quiet. right? But you can, so uh, what I want to do is resonate this tuning fork on this, use this pipe to resonate the tuning fork. Okay, so I'll start by just hitting it over here. You can't hear it very well. You can probably hear it pretty well now, right? It's quite a bit louder. Why? Because the depth of this pipe right now, which is just a little bit over 16 centimeters, 16 centimeters is a fourth of the wavelength of the frequency this tuning fork is producing. Okay, this tuning fork is producing 493.9 hertz. So, what's the wavelength of 493.9 hertz? Can anybody do that? You should be able to. Yeah. Okay. So, what would a fourth of that be? There you go, half a foot, aka 16-ish centimeters. Okay. So that's what I mean by resonance. Okay. When I when I take this thing that is oscillating a sound, and I stick it over this this chamber that is 16 centimeters deep, that frequency fits really well inside of that space. So well, in fact, that it throws a little party. Okay, that's what I mean by resonance. It gets louder. This is why we attach big boxes to musical instruments. Okay, this is why guitars have big boxes attached to them. And, the, and there's like a, and obviously like the size of a guitar is like, it, is it like 
it's like the size of it is like they think about that so it's yeah that is very purposeful right that's okay <laughs> the size of the box is purposeful it's 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 a very specific size and shape that allows it to resonate the frequencies that those strings are trying to produce. So those frequent when you pluck that string on the guitar, the string is not really making the sound you hear. <laughs> okay? What the string is doing is exciting the box, and the box then makes the sound. Okay? Because it because that little vibration on the string resonates inside that box, and that box shoots that that resonance out to you, and you hear it. Okay? Now Right, so if you can make it be a, if it, a complicated shape, then you have lots of different lengths, right? So think about that shape of, so of the guitar, right, that's doing something like this. How many different lengths do we have in there between two surfaces, right? There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, right? <laughs> lots of different lengths, okay? So that's all on purpose. It wasn't just by accident that that happened. People spent a whole lot of time trying to figure that out. You can say that we'll talk about this later, but how does that work with like an electric guitar? Because there's no totally different. Okay. <laughs> like, totally different yep. Well, amplitude is what we are manipulating. Yeah. Okay. So by uh, as your input, as you increase the um, frequencies, um, amplitude before it goes in. Sure. Yeah. So so you know I can I can hit the tuning fork and make it do a very low amplitude. Right. Or I can hit it harder and get a bigger amplitude. Is right. So, what you're resonating. Um, so it is possible to clip the air. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so uh, now you got to now it, it, it's only possible to clip the air at the refraction. Okay. Okay. You can't really clip it at the compression, right? Yeah, I mean, you could infinitely compress, but you can only stretch the air out so far until it breaks, okay? It breaks, breaking the sound barrier, okay? <laughs> Sonic booms, okay? <laughs> you literally are clipping the air. So because this is a pipe that is closed at one end and open at the other, the fundamental resonant frequency has a wavelength that is four times as long as that pipe. So this is looks like about 16.2 centimeters deep. So 16.2 centimeters times four gives you the wavelength of whatever frequency is going to resonate in here. And that just happens to be something in the neighborhood of 493.9 hertz. Now I've got other tuning forks, and we could get more and get and figure out all kinds of depths and everything. But then we'd never get it to the rest of the stuff I want to do today. But if you ever want to do that, you can. I've got more tuning forks, and you can look up their frequency, and you can figure out, hmm, how much water would I have to put in here in order to get this tuning fork to resonate? And you could do the math and figure it out. <coughs> Wouldn't be too tough. Okay. Uh, all right. Now this can happen in the air too. We can resonate rooms. And now we're getting into the, the, the concept that is important to us. So just like we can resonate a little teeny pipe like that, we can resonate the room in which we are, are sitting right now. So would you like to hear what that sounds like? So let's resonate the room. OK, so let me explain what I'm doing here. So I've got lots of different frequencies I can do here. Some of, as, as I sweep through them, you hear some sound louder than others, right? Because some resonate in the room and others do not. So there's one that got louder, right? 121 hertz was louder than the other ones. So it's resonating the room right now. 
The way we can prove that is if you get up out of your seat and walk around, you'll hear it get louder and quieter, louder and quieter as you walk around the room. So do it. So find a spot where the sound goes away and then stop there. Find different spots. Like <laughs> each person find a different spot or my thing won't work. <laughs> okay. Like here's an interesting spot where it goes away. Okay, so what is the wavelength of 121 hertz? Thousand divided by 120. Ish. Yeah, it's like it's like nine or ten feet, right? Okay, so Interestingly enough, that's sort of about the distance that you all are apart from each other. OK? So we're resonating the room, which means this, this frequency is stuck inside this room. It fits really well. Uh, and so there are places where you're hearing you know, the anti-node of the wave, and there's places where you're hearing the node of the wave, where the air isn't moving. Okay, so we've resonated the room. Okay, you can come sit back down again. These are called standing waves. And that happens. <laughs> happens in real rooms. It can happen in your sound system. Your sound system can create a standing wave inside of the room. And that's a frequency that you are going to have a hard time controlling. Because it's gonna every time you try to make that sound in your room, it's gonna throw a party, and there's no knob that's gonna be able to fix that because it's the room that's doing it. So okay. Is that why people are like, this room, this room is bad, because it's one of the variables, you know, of one of many variables that contribute to that. Uh, but it's but it is a thing, right? This is absolutely. A thing. You, you, there's no way you can EQ your way around that problem, because as you can see, it's not consistent, right? You're gonna be sitting in one place going, "Wow, 121 hertz is so loud," and then 10 feet to your left, it's not. <laughs> That's because it's a standing wave, okay? Uh, that becomes more of a problem with smaller rooms, I'd assume, because you get to a point where the bigger rooms are resonating with frequencies you wouldn't be able to. Sure. You know, I mean, so if we're assuming fundamental resonances, now there would there could be there could definitely be standing waves that would be, you know, that would be higher, right? But uh, there are also the variances are closer together, right? So you will talk about like one kilohertz. Yeah, you could res you could resonate a room with one kilohertz, but you know that difference between node and anti node is going to be like six inches, right? And it's so, and that's so that's going to be harder for you to discern. So this is more of an issue at lower frequencies because, at the fundamental frequencies, because those are the ones that have, have large enough wavelengths that you can actually physically hear a difference as you move around, right? So uh, this, and I'm not, I'm not saying that this is a huge, massive problem that you have to think about in, when you're dealing with sound systems in rooms, but it is. A concept, and it's a it's a variable that you have to think about, and it's a variable that comes into play in lots of parts of sound systems. It comes into play in loudspeakers. Okay, just like we can resonate a sound in a room, we can resonate a sound inside of a box that has speakers in it. Okay, and when the goal of a good loudspeaker be to not have any resonance to it? Perhaps, yeah, okay. uh, but that ability of the box to resonate would have an impact on the frequency response. It would also have an impact potentially on the dispersion of the, of the sound coming out of the loudspeaker, like how consistently does it disperse the sound. Uh, it has to do with the size of the drivers and the size of the box. Okay, um, These are some of the things that, you know, that Bob McCarthy was talking about with the line arrays, right? The bigger you get them, 
the lower frequencies they're able to control. Yep. Okay. So uh, it's that is not the same thing as resonance, but it is connected. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is the size of things affects the way the sound is able to propagate in and around that thing. Okay. That's the point I, I want. I want to make sure you get is that. The ability of sound to propagate around in and inside and around you and, and things and rooms and objects is connected to their size. Okay. Uh, so let's try um, some of this math now. Are you ready to jump back into some math? Uh, one question. Yes. <laughs> so what exactly is a standing wave? A standing wave is a frequency that resonates inside of the room. Where the room is becomes the resonator, okay? okay? Uh, so it's a frequency that essentially gets stuck inside the room. It it fits perfectly, <laughs> okay? And therefore it gets it does this really weird thing, where as you depending on where you are in the room, you actually hear the nodes and antinodes of the wave, mm -hmm. okay? So. Uh, Here's a question. What is the lowest frequency that will resonate in a one foot tube that is closed at one end? Kai says 250 hertz. Let's, let's talk through that. So the, this is in our head. Okay, so just using 1,000 feet per second as the speed of sound. So if it's a tube that is closed at one end, uh, what is the wavelength we're going to be talking about here? One foot tube closed at one end. Whatever this frequency is, is going to have a wavelength that is how much longer than four times longer, right? Because if it's closed at one end, then the fundamental frequency, resonant frequency, is four times longer than the tube. So it's going to be four feet, right? We're looking for a frequency that has a four foot wavelength. So that's speed of sound, 1,000 feet per second, divided by four feet gets us. 250 hertz. So yes, Kai, you are correct. Did anyone else get that? This is an easy one. I just want to make sure that, remember, it's not correct unless three people get the same answer. So it says one foot. Mm -hmm. how, did you, how did you know to change it to four? Because remember, uh, pipe that's closed at one end, open on this end, closed at this end, fundamental resonant frequency has a wavelength it is four times the length of the pipe. No matter what, so what, no matter what the length of the pipe is, if it's closed at one end, it's it quadrupled. Yep. Okay. The fund, the, the wavelength of that fundamental frequency is going to be four times as long as that pipe. Okay. So we have a one-foot tube or or pipe, whatever you want to call it here, which means that the fundamental resonant frequency, the lowest frequency that will resonate inside of there, is going to have a wavelength that is four feet long. Okay. Okay. So we can say speed of sound divided by four feet, and we get 250 hertz. 250 hertz is the lowest frequency that would resonate inside of there. Anything lower than that isn't going to fit. It's too big. OK. Uh, so what is the wavelength on the string of the fundamental re resonant frequency of a two-foot piano string? So. This is a string on piano, so that'd be fixed at each end, okay? Uh, and I'm going to vibrate that. It's a two-foot string, and that two-foot string, when I pluck it, will generate some sort of frequency. And that frequency will have a wavelength of what? Hint: It's not two feet. It's larger than two feet. How much larger? Twice as long, right? Remember the, remember the string here? That fundamental frequency that was going up and down and up and down? Okay. And we said we're only seeing half of the wavelength right now in that string, which means that for a string, the wavelength is twice as long as the string. Okay? So if the string is two feet, then the wavelength of the fundamental frequency it produces is going to be four feet. behave in a way that it would be comparable to a 
people went in on one side, closed on the other side too, or is that just not possible because of how the strings work? Because I mean, it, it makes sense that this is like this, but so that it, uh, it wouldn't be a string, but like harmonicas work that way. Oh. Okay. If you think about a harmonica that has like this bar that wiggles back and forth, and it's attached at one end, right? There's a screw right there. And you blow into the harmonica, and the little bar vibrates up and down. So that's kind of like a string. And that would be that whatever that frequency is, that wavelength would be four times as long as that little bar. Okay. But a string is a little too loose to like you couldn't have it like not attached at the other end and have it actually do anything useful for you. It has to be more, a bit more rigid than that. Okay. Okay, fundamental frequency of a closed 10 foot long hallway. Okay, so yeah, enclosed, right? So nothing open. Uh, 10 feet long is this hallway. Now, so interesting thing. So let me just sort of diagram what's happening inside of, so we, we can, you know, rooms behave kind of like the tube does or the pipe does, okay? And remember I said that if it's open at both ends, then that frequency has a wavelength that's twice as long as that. Okay? And, the, and the idea behind here, if I were to kind of draw this as a graph of the air pressure amplitude, what's happening is you know, the air is, going, is blowing across the opening of this tube, right? And so that we would have very high pressure here. And, it, and at the opposite end, okay? Which means the node, very, we would have that's essentially the portion, that's your half of the wavelength right there, okay? So you've got anti-node on either end of the pipe, but node in, this, in the middle, okay? Now if we cap one end of this pipe, then what happens is we end up with a node there and still anti-node at the opening. And this is, so then if you draw the rest of this wave, it's, there's, there's three times, you know, you have to multiply this by four, whatever that length is, that we, we're missing the other three-fourths of this, okay? Now, if we take that same pipe and we cap both ends, and somehow manage to excite the space inside of it, <laughs> okay? That means we have node at this wall, node at this wall, and anti-node in the middle. Still is representing only half of the wave, right? It's just shifted a little bit in phase, okay? So what I'm getting at is if you close it at both ends, Mathematically, it's the same as being open at both ends. Okay, it's only if you have one end closed and one end open that it's, that it does something different. It's just okay. Part of the wave. Yeah, it's a it's, okay. it's 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 essentially it's a phase difference. Okay. So, okay. so then the ten foot becomes twenty. Yeah. So we're looking at in this case we're looking for a frequency that has a wavelength of twenty feet. So what frequency has a wavelength of twenty feet? So it's one thousand divided by 20. Jason says 50 hertz. Anybody else concur? So I would concur with that. And can anyone else do that math and conf conf yes, concur? Please. Okay, great. Uh, is that so? The close on both ends is behaving like a speaker. Close. Uh, not really. It's, not really so much it's a little bit. It's quite a bit more complicated than that, but. Okay. Um, because is well, the speaker yeah, really closed, I was gonna say, right? I mean, because like, there's te there's technically an opening, right? Most of this a couple of times. It's like, yeah. What would the room be made out of? And like, yeah. How tall is the room? Yeah. I I I don't want you guys to get too deep into okay. sort of like a higher level details at the moment. Oh. The bit that I'm trying to drive home now is that the size of things affects the frequencies at, that those things can control and or resonate and or propagate. Okay. That's the part I want you to think about. Okay. Uh, 
Let's see what our next thing is here. What frequency will a two and a half foot organ pipe produce? Okay, so a two and a half foot organ pipe would be, you know, effectively closed at one end, open at the other. Okay, and you've got some some way that you get the air in there. Okay, uh, so we're to looking for a wavelength of what in this scenario? Yeah, so it's going to be four times that length of the pipe, right? Because it's closed at one end, open at the other end. Okay. So how long would that be? Two and a half times four. That's 10 feet, right? So we're looking at a at wavelength equals 10 feet. So that frequency would be 1,000 divided by 10. And that would be what? 100 hertz. Ish. You know, now if we did the real speed, it's 1,130 feet per second divided by 10, we're going to get 113 hertz, right? If, assuming that's your speed of sound. Okay. Uh, so this is all just by way of saying that, yes, the size of things affects the sorts of frequencies that are able to propagate in and around that that thing, and you can predict that, right? Knowing there, it, it is that is a predictable behavior. Um, all right, we need to we'll, we'll do these ones later. So this is this will be in the worksheet. Uh, a room 16 by 6 by 8. Uh, there's three potential frequencies there, right? Three resonant frequencies. If I if I sort of try, I mean, I apologize for this, but if I try to sort of orthographically draw this room, right, it would be something like this, and then you know there would be these sort of right phantom corners that we can't see, right inside. Okay, so. We're going to have really three different enclosed spaces, right? We have whatever that is. So that's 16 feet. We've got floor to ceiling. And that would be our 8 feet. And then we'd have front wall to back wall. And that would be our 6 feet, OK? So there's potentially three fundamental resonant frequencies that could exist inside this room. And knowing that, then you could figure those out. Okay, so I think there's a question on the worksheet where you could you could sort that out. Okay. So is that why concert halls and nice rooms that are supposed to sound acoustically good are uh, have a lot of 45 degree angles? Well, so that that's one way you can combat standing waves, right? Is if you can eliminate parallel walls, then you won't have the wave get stuck. Right, it's going to constantly move around. Okay, uh, okay. So now let's talk. About, I've I've been hinting at phase. Okay, and I really want to make sure we get through this comb filtering thing before we run out of time. Uh, so there are we've talked about these other properties of of waves. Right, there is amplitude that we've talked about already. And amplitude is you know if you draw it as a, a graph here, a sine wave graph uh, or a transverse wave of air pressure amplitude, then you know, the higher this thing goes up, that's that's called amplitude. It's higher amplitude. That is more compression, more rarefaction. That usually translates into louder sound. Okay, higher amplitude, louder sound. Okay, so the amplitude is another uh, property of a wave. Another property of the wave is its phase. And phase is, is time. It's where in time are we along this wave? Okay. So down here we've got our original wave, right? And then over here to the right we have that same wave, but we're looking at it at a slightly different point in time. Okay. We've we've moved, and oops, and we're starting it here which was actually this spot in the original. Okay, so we've, we've moved forward in time a little bit. And we're, we're looking at it at a slightly different time. That's phase. Which phase of the wave are we? The phase we're currently in is the first refraction is where we're starting. Okay, so phase is time. All right, now uh, phase is not to be confused with Polarity. 
Polarity is a slightly different thing that looks the same if all you ever do is stare at, at graphs of sine waves. Okay, So polarity is positive and negative, compression or refraction. I could flip the polarity without ever changing time. right? So my source wave here, if I just had it do a refraction first and then a compression, I haven't changed anything about time. I've just had it start by going a different direction. That's polarity. Okay, So it's a little bit different. Uh, and the difference between phase and polarity, when you're talking about sine waves, is, is effectively there is no difference when you're talking about sine waves. They are functionally the same thing. You know, a, a polarity inversion is the same thing as a 180 degree phase shift Okay, for a sine wave. When you get into complicated sounds that have lots of frequencies happening all at the same time, then polarity and phase become very different issues, Okay, as I will demonstrate here in a moment. Uh, so let me uh, now show you kind of what happens when you start messing around with this stuff. Okay, uh, What is next here? It doesn't show me. Hold on. Oh, there we go. Yeah. OK, so if I have two different sine waves that are the same frequency and the same amplitude, so everything about them is the same, and the only thing I do is change the phase. In other words, I offset one of them in time. There are lots of different sorts of things that could happen if I then put them together. right? So I, if I take those two different sounds and make them happen in the same room, but at a slightly different time, if that difference in time is a full would represent a full 180 degrees phase shift. And by 180 degrees, what I mean is you know, that one full cycle of starting at zero, going to compression, going to refraction, and back, that's a circle. right? It ends up where it started. Okay? So this would be zero degrees, and this would be 360 degrees. And this spot would be 180, this would be 90, and that would be 270. Right? Does that make sense? OK, so, um, so if I offset these two sounds, these two sine waves, by 180 degrees and tried to make them happen in the same space, then one of them would be trying to do a compression at the same time that the other one's trying to do a refraction. You can't, do both, you can't both push and pull the air at the same time. right? You've got to do one or the other. And so the net result would be nothing. Nothing would happen. It's called a cancellation. So the dotted line represents that there is something that is trying to excite the sound in that way, but there's also another thing that's trying to do the exact opposite. And so the net result is nothing. It's called a cancellation. You get no sound. Okay. Now, if they are perfectly in phase, so they're happening perfectly at the same time, or at least some multiple of time that would represent a multiple of 360 degrees, right? then they help each other. Right Now you have two different things, both pushing on the air at the same time and pulling on the air at the same time. And therefore, they're going to be able to push it a little bit further, aren't they? Amplitude is going to go up in that case. So zero degrees relative phase between two identical sounds is what's called a reinforcement. They reinforce each other, and the sound gets louder. Okay. Now, there are other sorts of things that can happen, too. For example, a 90 degrees relative phase would result in a, slightly, a wave that is slightly louder. Just a little bit, not quite as loud as you know if they were perfectly in phase. It will get slightly louder, but the resulting wave, look, is offset in phase. You see that? The point in time when it's doing its its perfect compression is between the t the times of the two compressions of the source wave. So there's a slight phase offset when you combine those together. It gets a, just a little bit louder and shifts a little bit in phase. The resulting wave. Okay. Are there Yes. You're getting a summation of yes. the two, um, but like 90 degree, I'm confused with how it's going from one square root of two. Yes, and this is math that is over my head. Okay. But but it like yes. It, it, sounds, it looks like unit circle right now. So. Yeah, it is. It, it, it's, it's, it, it involves using you know the sine, tan, and cosine buttons on your calculator. Gotcha. <laughs> and then you can figure that out. But it's not something that's ever been particularly important to me. Okay. okay? Uh, remember, I'm the guy that. 
never actually finished Algebra 2. So, uh, so I don't know, but yes. Okay. And I, 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 I'm pretty sure that my co-author wrote something about that in my book. Okay, so, because <laughs> uh, she understands those kind of things and I don't. Okay, yes, she was the math half of our team. <laughs> uh, I was the guy that would explain what that meant. Like she would, she would do all the math, and I would say, "Okay, here's why that matters in in real life, right?" <laughs> uh, so there's there's another scenario that is kind of interesting to me, which is that if you have um, a 120 degree phase difference, then you actually get no change in amplitude when those two signals sum together. They sum together to create the exact same amplitude, but you still have that slight phase shift. Okay, in the resulting wave. So it is possible to actually create the sound twice, but have no increase in amplitude. Right? That is possible. And I think that's just sort of interesting. That's sort of a gee whiz thing. Okay? Uh, but the bit of this that is particularly interesting to us are these first two. The fact that we can completely cancel out a sound, prevent it from propagating, or we can perfectly reinforce it and make it louder. That's really interesting. And that is something that this phenomenon you will run into every single day of the rest of your life working in sound. You will be dealing with this problem of sometimes things are getting canceled out and sometimes things are getting louder. Okay, I'll explain it more in a moment, but I want to sort of drive this home a little bit with a quick little uh, demo. So here I am, and uh, I have the ability here to create two different sounds. And at the moment, they're the same frequency, right? 441 hertz. Now, let's see, this needs to be at zero. There we go. So what's interesting about this is they are both the same amplitude and the same frequency and the same phase. And they're being summed together into this graph line. And it's bigger, right? It got bigger. It's a higher amplitude because they're perfectly lined up in time. And therefore, we're getting a reinforcement. But let me try to manipulate the phase of this. So if I go to closer to 90, remember what happens at 90? We get a little bit of an increase, but it's offset in phase, and you can see that, right? The resulting wave here is, is starting at a different time than these other two, okay? Now, what if I go to, what was that magic number where, not, where you get no change in amplitude? 120. So there's, there's a difference of 120 degrees now. There's a phase difference, but the amplitude of the resulting wave is the same. Now, what, if, what, what was the magic number that gets cancellation? 180. So look what's happening here. At the same point in time, one of them is doing a compression and the other is doing a refraction. And so they are canceling out. Yes, I'm doing this. Okay. I'm doing this mathematically, not physically. Okay, but I mean, like, I'm, I mean, like, in, in your processing in your computer, that's before it hits an actual. Yes. So the signal coming out is. Yes. Just slow. Okay. We'll do it in the air in a moment. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so at the moment, we're doing it digitally. Okay. But it's it it the result is the same. Okay. So um, and just to prove the point, I can invert the polarity and get that cancellation as well for a sine wave. Right. But watch what happens if I invert the polarity and now start screwing with the phase again, I can get it to come back. Because even though the polarity is different, I can, I can mess with the phase and change the way that interacts. Okay, so polarity and phase are actually different things. Okay, they're not the same thing. They're often confused as the same thing. Okay, but they are not the same thing. They are different. Polarity, well, phase is all about time, and polarity has nothing to do with time. So, uh, all right, so that's sort of interesting, I think. So if wave B is 180 degrees out of phase from wave A, yes. if it's less in amplitude, will you still get 
cancellation, but just lose whatever that amplitude is. Right. Situation. Yeah. So, it, so you won't get the perfect cancellation unless they are both the exact same amplitude. If one of them is quieter than the other, then it won't be a perfect cancellation. So it just yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, OK. So now let's take this one step further. And this is where you get to the part where I say you'll deal with this every day for the rest of your life. Now imagine we have more than just one frequency happening at one time, okay? which is the majority of sounds you hear in your life. OK, well, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Let's talk about that afterwards. Um, so uh, the majority of sounds you hear in real life have more than just one frequency happening. Okay, they have lots of frequencies happening. My voice, you're hearing hundreds, thousands, millions of frequencies happening right now with my voice. Okay? So let's say we have a complex sound right, that has lots of frequencies happening on time, and we somehow have two copies of that. Okay? One of them is happening at, at a particular time, and the other one is happening a little bit later. Okay? So some difference in time, a millisecond maybe. Okay? Well, Depending on the frequency, that one millisecond is going to represent, well, a foot. But that one foot is going to represent a different part of a wavelength, depending on the frequency, right? So for one frequency, that distance of a foot, or that offset in time, could be a full 360 degree offset in phase. But at another frequency, so a frequency that's half that, so that that same distance would only represent a 180 degree phase shift. Okay, So for the same offset in time, there's one frequency that is going to do what? This first one, what will happen? Get a boost. It'll get louder, right? Because it's, it's, yeah, reinforced, because it's some multiple of 360. What's going to happen to the other one? Cancellation. It's going to cancel out, right? Because it's a 180 degree difference. Now guess what? That, that situation of some frequencies will cancel out, some will reinforce, that happens across your entire frequency spectrum. And this is the resulting frequency response. So this is one millisecond of difference between two complex sounds. And we have, so on here, on, horizontally we have the frequency, and vertically we have the amplitude, or the sound pressure level, okay? And Here's a frequency that's canceling out. Here's a frequency that's getting louder. Here's a frequency that's canceling out. Here's one that's reinforcing, canceling, reinforcing, canceling, reinforcing, canceling, reinforcing. Your reinforcements should um, repeat the same as cancellation by as it increases in octave from that frequency. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So there's some math to this that we'll, we'll learn in a minute. Uh, this is called comb filtering. Okay. And comb filtering is welcome to the rest of your life. You, spend, you will spend most of your time combating comb filtering in one form or another, OK? Because this sounds really not good, OK? If you've got a bunch of frequencies that are getting canceled out, and a bunch of frequencies that are getting louder, and then all the frequencies in between are doing something else, that's not going to sound very good, right? That is not going to sound very even. Uh, so because as we know, in between this notion of cancellation and reinforcement, there are some frequencies that are not changing at all. There are some frequencies that are changing only a little bit. right? So it's not just cancellations and reinforcements that happen, but cancellations and the reinforcements are the things we tend to hear the best. We can hear when suddenly a bunch of frequencies disappear from our sound. Okay? And we can hear when a whole bunch of them suddenly get a whole lot louder than the rest of them. Like We can hear that. Would you like to hear it right now? OK, let's hear it right now. Uh, so well, I'm just going to do it with, with pink noise first. OK, so I, I'm generating, you can't, it, it sounds like one thing right now, but I'm actually generating two different pink noise sources. OK, and right now I'm going to, com I'm combining them but I'm going to delay one of them a little bit. Yes, exactly. So uh, I'm just going to delay it a little bit. So right, let me, hang on, I 
need this other one. Okay, so I've got some frequencies canceling out, some reinforcing. That's quite a bit different, right, than what we had before. Here's, here's zero. That's the full sound. And now I've delayed one of them by 15 samples on the computer, and I've got a problem now. This does not sound super awesome. And depending on how much I delay them, affects which frequencies cancel out and which ones reinforce. Okay? So as I reduce the delay a little bit, I shift the shift it to higher frequencies, right? As I increase the delay, I shift this problem down to lower frequencies. Okay? Now let's hear what that sounds like with actual music. Okay? So here's the original. And I'll do the same thing. Okay. Not super awesome. Here's here's what it originally sounded like. Right? I'll take it to 30 samples. Just lost a bunch of stuff. Okay. Now, just to mess with you a little bit, tell me if you've ever heard this type of sound before. Sound familiar? Yeah. Okay, this is my way of saying this is not necessarily a problem. <laughs> okay, comb filtering is just a thing that happens. Maybe that makes a sound that is good to you, mm -hmm. right? Like electronic musicians do this all the time. They create a sound that goes, right? And it's cool, right? They make it part of their music, okay? So it's not necessarily bad. It's just a thing that happens. In the, con in, in the context of sound system reinforcement in design, usually it's bad. But in the, from the point of view of content creation, it might be good, right? Yeah. So what are all the different ways? Let's think of some ways that this could happen to us in real life. Okay. So let's say we have, all right. Some, some of you were involved with or at least saw what was going on with Sideshow last fall, right? Okay. How many microphones did they have out on there on that show? Okay, so maybe 60 microphones out there on that stage, okay? How far apart were they from each other? Not that far, because the yeah. band was behind. Yeah, I mean, like in the band, like maybe a foot or two in between each yeah, other, yeah. right? Yep. Uh, in the actors, right? If two actors wearing, worth wearing microphones, they're standing near each other, yeah. right? That, that never happened, right? <laughs> happened the whole entire show. There were two people that were literally attached at the hip. They were each wearing microphones, mm -hmm. okay? Well. That microphone that is on one person is not going to pick up just that one person. It's going to pick up everything around it, okay, including the person standing next to them. So the Siamese twins, both wearing microphones, each microphone picks up both of their voices. Right. Okay, so you've got two microphones, both picking up the same sound, but at a different time. Oh, because of the distance. Yeah. So here's me, I'm wearing a microphone, and my voice is six inches away from the microphone. There's somebody standing next to me who is a foot and a half away, also picking up my microphone, and also picking up me, Okay. right? And that happens, so you've got these two microphones that are picking up the same sound, but at a different time. And then where do those microphones go? The sound that comes out of the, where does it end up? It ends up in a mixing console, right? And what do we do in mixing consoles? Mix. We mix those sounds together and then shoot them out of loudspeakers. Well, if we mix these two sounds together that are really the same sound, but heard at a slightly different time, and then we mix them together, yeah, this happens. Okay. 
It's called comb filtering on the wire, which is what you just heard. Okay. Uh, another scenario where that could happen. Two loudspeakers putting out the same sound. Does that ever happen? Yeah. yeah. Most likely your sound system has more than one loudspeaker. And most likely you've got the same sound coming out of more than one loudspeaker. Well, if that same sound hits the audience from each loudspeaker at a slightly different time, like if the audience is slightly closer to one loudspeaker than they are from the other one, that same sound is going to arrive at that listener twice, but at a different time. And if it arrives at a different time, it's going to do this thing, OK? So, that, so the first scenario is on the wire, which is what you just heard, OK? And when it happens on the wire, in other words, inside your mixing console, everybody hears it, no matter where they sit, because it's in the signal that comes out of every single loudspeaker. It's comb filtering. If it happens in the air, it's a slightly different situation. So let's do it in the air now, shall we? So I've now got, remember, I'm generating peak noise twice. I'm doing it once out of the left, and the other one's coming out of the right. Okay. Now listen to what happens as I start messing with it. Okay, you can kind of hear. It's nowhere near as noticeable, though, as on the wire. And the reason is because depending on where you sit, you're hearing a different, in different distance in time, right? Okay, so. You know, Taylor is a different distance away from the two loudspeakers than Jason is. And so the comb filtering you're hearing is different from the comb filtering that Taylor is hearing. Uh, and so on and so forth. Everyone hears a slightly different thing. And as you move around, even move your head around, it changes, right? The frequencies that cancel and reinforce change. Can you hear that? Okay. So it's this thing that is not very uniform. And in reality, we have spent our entire life listening to sounds like that. That is happening to my voice right now. OK? You, another situation where you'd hear the same thing twice is when it reflects. OK? So you're hearing my voice directly from me to your ear. You're also hearing it bouncing off the floor. You're hearing it bounce off this wall and get back to you. You're hearing it bounce off the table and get to you. So you're hearing my voice lots of times. It's the same sound, more or less the same amplitude, but coming at you multiple times in, with a difference in arrival time. OK? It is comb filtering right now in the air. But we have learned, because we hear this all the time, this comb filtering in the air, our brains have learned how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, We have learned that this, what this sounds like, what is physically happening, can't possibly be supposed to sound like that. Okay, And so your brain sort of recognizes these comb filtering patterns in the air and is, has an incredible capacity to fix it. Right in the way it's in the psychoacoustic process of your brain. Okay. But when it's on the wire, can't do it. Because, and is that because? Because I understand like the physical thing, but like, is it because like with sideshow? I didn't see it, but with the two people standing next to each other, and because like if they weren't wearing the microphone, yeah, it would be. Or if they were like, I don't know, like just. If it was just if no technology was involved, yeah, we would just be able to deal with it. Right. Well, but there would be some comb, comb filtering. It would just be happening in the air, right, from, because of reflections. But, but again, like we could just we can deal with that. But because it's happening like where their sound is going into the microphones and through the mixing console and like being regenerated. It has to do with the fact that we have two ears uh -huh. that are in two physically different spots in space. Okay. And so our ability to, to cope with this when it happens in the air is because we have two different ears that both hear the same thing, but a slightly different time. And we can recognize when the comb filtering is happening as a result, like something different is happening over here than is happening over here. And if that is the case, then, it, then what we're hearing can't possibly be what is, what is supposed to sound like. And so it kind of figures out what is the difference between these two things happening and then is able to fix in your brain. But if the same problem is coming into your left ear that's, that hits your right ear, you don't have the ability to sort it out the difference, right? Because it's like, well, it's the same. I guess it must okay. be meant to sound like that. Okay. okay. And when it happens on the wire, that's what happens. What comes out of the loudspeaker is already comb filtered. And therefore, it hits both ears comb filtered. I, okay. And your brain can't fix it because okay. it can't tell the difference, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. I get it. Okay. So there are lots of different ways that you can create a comb filter. Lots of different ways. And this is why I say you're going to deal with it the rest of your life. But there are also lots of ways you can sort of deal with it when it happens, right? 
we'll get into that uh, later, but you know, there are ways of dealing with this. For one, the fundamental way of dealing with this is to realize that our capacity to compensate for it is much better if it happens in the air. Okay, if the comb filtering happens in the air, our brains can deal with it much better than it can deal with it if it's happening inside of our system. And so if you can push that problem into the air, then it's better, right? But if you, so you want to avoid it happening inside of your mixing console, if, it, if at all possible. Uh, there are some other kind of rules of thumb to that, but we'll get into that later. All right, so you can actually predict this, it turns out. Uh, and just, just to kind of set the stage for how we might be able to predict this, let's just kind of think through a couple of scenarios here. So if I had 250 hertz, and I had two different instances of 250 hertz, how much would I have to delay one of them to make it 90 degrees out of phase? So let me just draw this wave here. So here's the one full cycle. 90 degrees would be there, right? And so what is the wavelength of 250 hertz? Four feet. 1,000 four feet. divided by 250 is four feet, OK? So to get to, to move that distance, when from here to here is four feet, well, that is one fourth of that total wave, right? So I would have to move it one foot. So if I had two loudspeakers making the same sound and I wanted to pull this off, I could move one loudspeaker one foot further away from the listener. And now that sound would arrive at the listener 90 degrees out of phase. OK? Now, uh, So that's a very simple example. Here's another one. Same scenario. What if I wanted to make it 270 degrees out of phase? How far would I have to move the loudspeaker? Three feet, right? Because 270 would be here, right? And that's 3 fourths of the distance. So yeah, move it three feet. And now that second sound would arrive 270 degrees out of phase. Yes, Kai. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Which is why I say the fact that this happens in the air is not something to get too concerned about because there's no way to make it not happen in the air. Gotcha. Okay. Right? <laughs> you have spent your entire life listening to comb filtering in the air and never knew it. Okay? Uh, so, you know, there are some situations where it happening in the air can be a problem for you, but it's much more of a problem when it happens on the wire inside your system somehow. Okay? Is precedence effect yeah. Well, more accurately, it is because of this skill that our brains have developed that precedence is possible. Okay. Okay. So, precedence, which we'll talk about at the end of the semester, is this blind spot in our hearing system that has evolved in order to compensate for comb filtering. Okay. So, it's this thing that happened for a different reason, right? We developed this skill for a different reason. But we, as sound designers, can exploit that skill okay. for a different purpose and to get a different result. Okay. Right? So that's, that's what's happening. OK, so let's talk about, so we've seen now at a very simple level, if we just look at a single frequency, uh, we can sort of predict phase differences and time differences in the result of that. So if we can do that at a very simple level, we could do it at a complicated level too. OK, so this would be the complicated level. So if we were going to now examine a full spectrum sound that had lots of frequencies happening all at the same time, we could predict which frequencies across the spectrum would cancel out and which frequencies would reinforce. So uh, just to explain some of these variables, fi is frequency of some integer, OK, 0 to whatever. So frequency 0, frequency 1, frequency 2, frequency 3. So frequency 0 is the first frequency that would cancel out. Frequency number 1 would be the second frequency that would cancel out. So frequency number 2 would so on and so forth. OK, so that's what that means. I is the same, you know, it's the same here. So uh, that would be which, which so frequency. Which integer is that? It's just like a number. It's a number that you choose. Any number, any integer between 0 that's greater than or equal to 0. 
okay? So and it just depends on which one you want. If you want to know what the first frequency to cancel out, then I is zero. If you want to know the second frequency to cancel out, then I becomes the number one, so on and so forth, okay? T is time, in this case, in seconds. So how many seconds of time is there between the two sounds? Okay, so if you plug that in, you will get, so let's say for that one millisecond difference in time that we were looking at before, one millisecond is how many seconds? Well, there's a thousand milliseconds in a second. Okay, so I have, if I have one millisecond, that would be 0 0.001 seconds. Okay. You just, you're going to have to get good at that conversion, OK? So t is 0 0.001 if we're talking about a one millisecond difference, OK? And then we would just pick a number for i. If we want to know the first cancellation, it would be 0. So 2 times 0 plus 1 would be 1, <laughs> divided by 2 times 0 0.001, which would be 0 0.002. So 1 divided by 0 0.002 would give us the frequency that cancels out first in that scenario, OK? Now, for, for uh, reinforcements, it's a little bit different. You still have the fi, you just remove the twos, basically, and you'll get the reinforcement. Okay, the first frequency to reinforce would be uh, 0 plus 1, so 1 divided by 0 0.001 would be the frequency that reinforces. Okay, this is not horribly difficult math. This is, this, is, this is basically the same math we were doing last week. It's just looking at it a slightly different way. Okay, uh, so uh, we've got five minutes. Let's try one of these. OK, so you've got two equal signals arriving at your listener. So perfectly coherent other than time, OK? And that difference in time is 1.5 milliseconds. What are the first three cancellations and reinforcements? All right, so uh, the first thing we need to find out, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this up in cancellations and reinforcements. So I'm going to say, uh, 0C for, the, for cancellation 0, cancellation 1, cancellation 2. Okay? And then we'll have the first reinforcement, second reinforcement, the third reinforcement. This is going to be our I, basically. Okay? So we're just going, we'll just lay this out one at a time here. What is T going to be in this scenario? 1.5 milliseconds. If one millisecond is 0 0.001, then 1.5 milliseconds would be 0 0.0015. Everybody understand that? You get that? OK, so that's T. So let's plug this in now. For if I, the first cancellation, this is going to equal 2 times 0 plus 1 divided by 2 times 0 0.0015. Can somebody do that math? Get your calculator out and do it. Three people have to get the right answer or it's not right. That's what I got. So I got it. Jason got it. I need one more person to get that answer, or it's not right. Yeah. Got it. Cool, we got it. OK, so that's right. OK, so our next cancellation would be 2 times 1 plus 1 divided by 2 times 0 0.0015. What's that going to be? Yep, 1,000 hertz or 1 kilohertz. Okay. Uh, let's let's we'll skip this, the next cancellation. Let's go to try reinforcement now. So this would be 0 plus 1 divided by 0 0.0015. So what's 1 divided by 0 0.0015? 666.6. Seven hertz, I would say. Yeah? See how this goes? This is not too tough. You could keep doing this forever until you start getting to frequencies that you couldn't hear anymore and you wouldn't care. 
Okay. Uh, so our next reinforcement would be 1 plus 1 divided by 0 0.0015. What would we get there? Yep. That's anybody else get that? Yeah. That's what I got. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, we're not gonna have time to do all of these. Oops. Ah, I didn't want to capture it. I just wanted to get rid of it. Um, let me skip ahead. Okay, so here's here's another. We can do this the other direction. So we know we've got a comb filter happening, and the first reinforcement is 1.5 kilohertz. <laughs> In that scenario, what would be the cancellation that would happen first? Well, to do that, we would need to find out the time, right? And if we just take this, this formula for reinforcement and solve it for t, it looks like this. It's actually t equals i plus 1 divided by you know, fre frequency i, OK? Uh, you can just trust me on that. But if you really get at algebra, you can see how that would work, OK? So let's do that first. Let's find out what t would be. So t is going to equal 0, right? Because we're talking about first reinforcement. So i would be 0. 0 plus 1 divided by 1500. Exactly, 1,500. 1.5 kilohertz. So what is 1 divided by 1,500? 0.0006. That's what I got. I got 0. 0.00067 yeah. seconds. So 0.67 yes. OK. I need one more person to get that. Uh, I didn't even get that. 1 divided by 1,500? I literally do not understand anything you're saying. So clear it up. Clear it up. Oh, it's just putting in scientific notation. You just uh, need to change that. So go to your preferences here and change that. Preferences. Um, so um, go to scientific notation. Or no, do normal. And pull that little thing out there. So 14? Yeah, try that. Just close that. Yeah. Okay. So what is 1 divided by 1500? 1500. No, not 15,000, 1500. Oh, maybe that's fine. Yeah, so if you say negative 4, so you can move the decimal place 1, 2, 3, 4, you get point. There's a preference here we got to fix to get that to show up the right way. So I'll look at it in a second. OK, that's fine. OK. okay. Uh, OK, so we know that, that, that t is now 0. 0.00067, right? So now we can find out the cancellation. So uh, the cancellation, so this would be 0c, is going to equal 2 times 0 plus 1 divided by 2 times that, right? 2 times 0. 0.00067. So let me show you how I would do that with the calculator. So the first thing I would do to solve this is I would say 2 times my t value, which is 0. 0.00067, right? And I get 0. 0.00134, OK? So that, that's, I've solved the bottom half of this. And I'll just put that into my calculator's memory, I'll the little C button to clear that up. And now I can do 2 times 0 plus 1. So that would actually just be 1, right? 2 times 0 plus 1 is just is 1. We can do that in our head. OK, so it's really just 1 divided by that value. So I say 1 divided by, and then that number I had in memory, and I get 746.27 hertz. That's the first cancellation. Two, two times t, okay, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. So I just did the bottom first so that I could then get it back later when I figured out the top. That's, that's, the, that's the way I like to solve these sort of things. Um, you might have a calculator where you could just plug that whole thing in in order and it would give it to you. That confuses me because I'm not sure I understand what's happening. 
And so I, I prefer to solve it a few steps at a time, so I'm making sure I know exactly what I'm doing at each step of the process. But whatever works for you, as long as you get the right answer. Okay. All right, that's all we've got time for. Um, what's that? So uh, I, you should now be able to hack around with everything on that worksheet now. I should have I've given you all the information you need to do the rest of that. Just as, a, as an FYI, if you want to solve for t using a cancellation frequency, it's this one. So you may want to just jot that down real quick. Because there might there will be a couple questions where you have to do that. So in this case, if you know the first cancellation and you got to figure out t, you could get that by t equals 2 times i plus 1 divided by 2 times the frequency of i. OK? So you may need that when you do the homework. So what I want you to do is spend the weekend kicking around this homework. Uh, try to take a crack at all of them. And we'll come back on Monday. And if you can have it printed out on a piece of paper, that would be helpful. Um, and I'll give you each a red pencil, and we'll go through them all one at a time and figure them all out. Okay? So if you if, so if you just make an attempt at all of them, and if you got it wrong, we'll fix them. Can you? I I guess I didn't write it down for some reason. The um the first um the this one. No 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 from last week. Yes. I don't, I didn't write down what C that wave thing and F stand for. Can you just? Oh, C is the speed of sound. F is the frequency, and that lambda sign is wavelength.